sure stay up. I forgot to charge my battery, so I mean I have microphone all through service on there. They, they uh, blocked us again on Facebook, so we're not able to post it tonight, right? It's on YouTube. It's just going to be on YouTube. I'll link it on the Facebook page. <laughs> there you go. I'm good. I got smart guys. You know, like that. <laughs> I was about to say, you can do that. Yeah. Bow your heads, if you would, please. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for the privilege and opportunity to share your word tonight, Lord. Father God, I thank you for knowing my heart, my mind, my mouth, my lips, and the words that come out of my mouth. Lord, glorify you, edify your people. I thank you for illumination and revelation, Father God, that the Holy Spirit leads and guides us in all truth. Thank you for giving us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to believe tonight, Father God. And Lord, I give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. And we do it in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. 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 All right. You will turn it to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 16. Remember we talked about it last time we had the Bible study. We were talking about how Paul had prayed. And this is what he's praying. He said, verse 16, Cease not to give thanks for you, and making mention you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of Lord, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being in enlightenment, you may know what is the hope of his calling, what the wishes of his glory, his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceedingly greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he brought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, saved on his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power, and might and dominion, and every name in his name, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Paul was praying that, our, that we would be enlightened, we get revelation, illumination in the Word. And so many times we just read it like we read a book, we don't get anything out of it. You need to allow the Spirit to show you how. When I first started, it didn't make no sense to me. So I began to pray and ask the Holy Spirit, show me what you're saying. Because I don't understand all this King James English. Okay? And all the symbolism and all the stuff that went along with it. So God began to break it down and make it simple, church, and he'll do the same thing for you. Because he wants you to receive the truth of the word of God. Amen? Yeah. And sometimes when we read the scripture, we read it according to how we read it before. We don't allow God to give us a revelation or show us something special. Sometimes we read through it so fast, we don't, the Holy Spirit had to run to catch up to us. <laughs> Amen? Well, tonight we're on lesson 14. It's talking about how does revival come. Revival is when people are completely in love with God. There's a freshness, a vitality, and an excitement about the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. In revival, the miraculous power of God is in manifestation. People are being healed, delivered, and saved, and baptized in the Holy Spirit. Churches are full and growing, and folks from all walks of life are turning back to God. Although I agree that we need revival, it's not going to come the way most people are presently pursuing most people teach to give revival, we must plead with God. Bombard heaven and grab hold of the horns of the altar, shake it until God comes out. They tell us that we have to make God pour out the revival, and that's simply not true. God wants us to have revival more than anything. We first opened the church up. We had a revival going on for almost a week. And, uh, people were standing at 1 o'clock in the morning, listening to prophecy and getting prayed for, and being healed and delivered from all kinds of things. And revival is awesome, awesome. And I think we should have more revival in church. Amen. But actually, we should come revive all the time. Yes. This is the house of God. This is our privilege to come here and worship Him. Amen. And we should remember that and not take it for granted. Where I'm going to church. You're coming to God's house. Exactly. Amen. Amen. And you don't ever know what God's going to do. Amen. Amen. So come with an expectation. Come pray with with expectation. I don't mean the literal pregnancy, okay? He said, God is much more motivated to send a revival than you are to receive one. He longs to see his nation revive and wholeheartedly following him. 
Could you imagine if this whole country was, was following God? Could you imagine what impact that would have on the whole world? He desires us to see us see us yielding to the Holy Spirit and applying godly principles from the Word to our lives. The Lord wants us to living in revival much more than we want. You aren't going to want to somehow or another get God up to speak with you. That's not what it's about. And so much of what is currently being said concerning prayer for revival is all about us begging God and pour out His pour out this and pleading with Him to send that. It's actually these intercessors that are praying for revival who are getting a tremendous amount of credit. From their perspective, if they aren't, weren't standing the gap, gap, God would just fold his arms and let the whole world go to hell. They don't believe he cared. They think they're causing him to repent by praying, oh God, repent and turn back to us. Don't you listen to what he says. Please don't misunderstand. I used to think that way too. For several years, I begged and pleaded with God for revival with all my heart. I'm not saying that people who do this are all wrong. Many of them see our genuine need for and they long to see God's power manifest. They're just trying to receive it based on the faulty model they've been given. I don't know about you, but I've been taught that before we have a revival, you've got to have intercessors, you've got to have people praying, you've got to bombard heaven, yes, you've got to bind up everything. Most people assume that God is so ticked off at, at us that he's holding back his Holy Spirit. Since man of the church as it may apply, has moved so far away from what he wants him to do, they perceive him as having turned his back on us. It's like his arms are folded. He's saying, I've given you over, forget you. They picture God with this attitude, and so they beg him, please pour out your spirit on us. Let your Holy Spirit fall on us again. And the intercessors jump in there praying, oh God, have mercy on us. Oh Lord, don't impute our many sins unto us. We're asking you for mercy and we're begging God to turn back to the church and plead with him to have mercy on the human race. That This is not a New Testament prayer. In the first verses of 1 Timothy 2, talk about praying for kings and all those in authority. Then in verse 5, the word says, there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There is now only one mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. A mediator is someone who stands between two parties that are at odds with each other, seeking to reconcile them. In the Old Testament, there was a gap between God and man. Sin has separated man from God, so mediators like Moses were needed. Galatians 3.19 says that the Old Testament law was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator, Moses. Moses stood between an angry God and sinful people. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be in that position. <laughs> Amen? Amen. There's a strong statement God was told to repent by one of his creation. It's hard to comprehend, but that's exactly what Moses said. Repent, O God, and turn from your fierce wrath. What's even more amazing is the Lord repented. Exodus chapter 32, verse 14. Moses stood as a meteor between an angry God and a sinful people. This worked under the old covenant because God was angry. Sin had separated mankind, man, mankind from him, and there was a judgment to be meted out. Therefore, it was appropriate for Moses to mediate. However, now that we're in the new covenant, Jesus has become our mediator. Hebrews chapter 7. There is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Jesus, listen, Jesus forever stood in between a holy God and an unholy people. He paid for our sins on the cross and took upon himself all the wrath and punishment due us from God. This isn't only temporary until the next time you sin is forever. When Jesus paid the price, the sacrifice, when he hung on the cross and then he rose again, when he paid that price, that price for which your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. Amen. If the price was not paid in full, then that means every time we sin, Jesus would have to crawl back up on the cross and be crucified again. But he paid for all those sins, church. Amen. Okay? Now, I was going to do it tonight, but I'm going to wait on it. But I've got a teaching I want to do that goes along with this. And it's talking about why do we have to confess our sins if Jesus already paid the price for us? And I'll tell you more about that later, okay? But he paid the sins for all time, church. Christ has forever reconciled God and man and has brought the two into eternal union and harmony. 
That's Second Corinthians chapter five, verse eighteen and nineteen. Whosoever will they receive this, whosoever will they receive this gift of God. When Jesus said on the cross is finished, he was speaking of God's wrath being satisfied. That's in John uh, chapter nineteen, verse thirty. Therefore, if Moses were to stand up today and pray, repent, O God, and turn from your fierce wrath, that would be Antichrist. It would be standing against and trying to take the place of what Christ has done. Moses' ministry of mediation was appropriate in the Old Testament because Jesus hadn't come yet. But now that he's come for us to pray, repent, O God, don't pour out your wrath on this city or nation or people. Have mercy on this Antichrist. You're trying to take the place of Christ and accomplish what he's already done. The way many of us have been praying and believing with God is literally against what Jesus Christ came to do. A lack of understanding. The New Testament has called many of us to pray for revival the way they do. Revival doesn't come by begging God. It comes by our recognizing that God loves people more than we do and by understanding that he wants us revived much more than even we do. We need to stop begging God to pour out his spirit and stop passively waiting on a lightning bolt from heaven. Instead, we need to praise the Lord that he wants these results even more than we do. We need to believe God's word and release our authority by going out and preaching the gospel. Amen. So bear with me. I know that's a lot to take in, but bear with me. If you go out and raise someone from the dead, you'll have all the revival you can handle. Amen. People Amen. want to see signs and wonders. Yeah. Right. They Amen. want to see the manifestation of God's power. Like I said, we had that revival and the gifts were flowing. People will stay to hear them, to see the gifts manifest, to get a word of prophecy. It's just sad. And this is pet peeve with me. It's just sad we don't have the same hunger for the word of God. Amen. Amen. Yes, that's right. You can, I can guarantee you, I tell you, we're having a evangelist next Sunday night. Come to church. Signs and wonders and miracles in place to pack up. Yes, it will. I can say, come next Sunday night. we got a preacher of the word. going to speak the word and give you some revelation. I doubt that many would show up. Church, it's the word that exactly. sets us free. It's Amen. the word that changes us. Amen. But so many, we want a shortcut. Give me a little dab of duty and give me a word from God so I don't have to do anything. Listen, even the word people give you from God, and I say this all the time, is conditional on you doing what God wants you to do. Amen. Therefore, then this will come to pass. Right. If you don't do it, it won't work. The right. same is true with the word. If you work the word, the word works. If you don't work the word, it's not going to work. Amen. Amen. With the word, right? Amen. 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 So many times we, we want somebody's flesh to stand in front of us and say, Thus saith the Lord. And there's nothing wrong with everybody. I love a, a good word from God every now and then. Every now and then he's being encouraged. But you know what? I get excited about this. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. So a lot of times people are following signs and wonders, but God said signs and wonders would follow us. Exactly. And then also, he says, signs and wonders will follow the word. Right, right. Okay? He yes. wants to confirm what you've been hearing by yeah. signs and wonders. Yes. yes. Everywhere these disciples went, they preached the word, and then they manifest signs and wonders. Yes. To prove that God was who he said he was, and Jesus was who he says he was. Mm -hmm. But it just hurts my heart because, listen, it's when Jesus was in the wilderness, and the devil was coming against him, he didn't say, well, hang on a minute, I need to go over here and get a word. <laughs> no. He had the word in him. In fact, he is the word. But he had the word in him. And what did he tell the devil? Yes. It's written. How do you overcome the devil? Yes. It's written. If you don't know what's written, when the devil comes against you, you go, whoa, hold on, devil. I need to run over here and get you a word. Hold on. David said, I hid your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Church, you need to get all. You can never get enough word in you. Amen. I don't know how I've been studying this a long time, Brother Robin has done, but we're still learning, we're still growing, we're still seeing things we never saw before. That's what's so nice about or so cool about the Bible. You can read a book and you got all the books God can give you. But this book is so intricate, so worked together, and everything, it just blows my mind sometimes, sometimes the way God does things. Amen. Amen. He says, but Andrew, you can't raise a person from the dead unless you already have a revival. I disagree. God isn't holding back the flow of his spirit. We are. It's the body of Christ that's clogging up the pipes and keeping God from flowing. 
What you need to do is work on your pipe. <laughs> right. Remember the illustration I told you about with the vacuum cleaner? Yes. Vacuum cleaner has all kinds of power and do what it's supposed to do. But if it gets clogged up, the power's still there. The nozzle's still there to do what it needs to do, but it can't do it because it's clogged up. That's Church, right. that's the way we are. God's Spirit wants to flow through us, but we've got a lot of flesh Come in on. the way is clogging up what God wants to do through us. Amen. That's good. Amen. Amen. If you've got unforgiveness and bitterness and jealousy and, and all those things inside you, then the power of the Holy Spirit has to flow through all that mess okay. to get to where God wants it to be, to do what God wants it to do. Amen. 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 And when we say, well, I'm not hurting nobody. Yes, you are. You're hurting yourself and you're hurting somebody God may use you to minister to because exactly. you've got so much stuff in you, so much flesh in you or whatever it is, trash in you, that God can't do what he wants to do. Amen. 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 And we don't stop to think about that. You know, well, God wants to use everybody. He has a purpose. Like I said, there's people he'll reach I can't reach. There's people Rob can reach that I can't reach. There's people I can reach that you can't reach. Right. Yeah. God wants to use you. And if you stay so full of yourself and so full of flesh and all this other stuff, God can't use you. Exactly. You'll not hear God. Amen. You'll hear the devil because he'll talk to flesh. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. He said, you need to work on yourself saying, Father, please forgive me for my unbelief. Forgive me for not doing what your word says. You said we're supposed to go and heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, and raise the dead. And I've been asking you to pour out your spirit and do these things without me. I've been pleading with you to move sovereignly. Please forgive me for that. Then take the word and start meditating on it. What does meditate mean? What? what? Means you sit on it. You know, like an old cow chewing his cud. You chew it on the word. You meditate on the word. You say it over silently or lightly under your breath and keep repeating. When you do that, when you meditate on it, then you give the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to enlighten you yes. and give you revelation. Yes, he does. Amen. Amen. So true. He said, if you start seeing the sick, well, let me back up here. He said, once you see on the inside with the eyes of your heart, blind eyes and deaf ears open, demons cast out, and the dead raised, then you'll start seeing it manifest in the physical realm too. You'll have revival. Listen. Many of the things of God, you need to get a hold on the inside. Yes. If, right. if you want healing, you need to see yourself healed. That's right. If you want Speak deliverance, it. you need to start seeing yourself delivered. Amen. Right. Amen. Okay? If you have a financial problem, you need to see yourself coming out of debt. Because if you don't see it on the inside, if you don't get a vision on the inside, it's never going to manifest on the outside. Amen. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so does he become. Yes. That's right. So you need to get, listen, I believe that I'm healed because Jesus said I'm healed. And I need to get a, a, a picture of that or a vision of that on right. the inside of me. Right. Not, well, one of these days I hope God heals yeah, me. No, no Lord, your right. word says by Jesus Christ, I am yes. healed. I'm playing yes. that. I'm confessing yes. that. I'm walking in that. I'm not giving place to nothing. Amen. These things come against my mind and try to cause me to doubt. I cast those things down. I don't give them no place in my life. Amen. 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 Bye, guys. You're healed. <laughs> Jesus. Amen. Claim it. He said, if you start seeing the sick regularly healed, they'll begin breaking holes on the roof to get into your meetings. Wouldn't that be cool? Yes. Seeing God manifest himself so so greatly that they can't even get through the doors. There's no room. They go cut a roof and yeah. hold the roof. Wow. Right. Wow. He said, if your shadow healed the sick and touched, there would be so many people crowding around. You'd have all the revival you could handle. You say, well, I don't believe that. If you say that and you believe that, it'll never happen. That's right. But you know what? If it happened to him and God says he no respect the person, then why can't it happen to you? Amen. That's right. He Amen. said all things are possible to him who believes. Amen. Amen. That's right. Listen, the only way we live in God is we don't believe it. Because you look at all through Scripture. I've said this many times. Y'all have it drilled in your heart. All through Scriptures, you see people. Your faith made you whole. Your faith heals you. And God was able to do the supernatural. 
Then you see through scripture where there was unbelief. And the same Jesus couldn't do anything because of their unbelief. That's not right. He was still Jesus. He right. still had the power right. to like the vacuum cleaner. Come on. Right. But he couldn't do anything because of their unbelief. Exactly. We want to think, well, you know, it makes us wish, well, if God won't be healed, he'll heal me. That puts a responsibility on okay, him. Thank you. And that takes us, makes our conscience feel better. Well, no, I can do about it. Yes, there is. Yes, you please. believe and you will receive it. If you don't believe it, God can't do anything about it. Amen. Yes. 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 God said the reason the Israelites didn't enter the promised land is because of unbelief. Amen. Yeah. Unbelief. God told them to go into the promised land. And he said, I, we talked about this before. He said, I've already given it to you. Well, in the natural, they're still over here, and the promised land is over there, and there's a bunch of giants and all kinds of people over there. But God says it's yours. Well, 12 of them went over there to check it out. Ken comes back and says, and you know, although God said, they come back and say, we can't do this. There's giants in the land, and we're like grasshoppers. Here's the problem. We're like grasshoppers in our eyes and in their eyes. It's bad I enough that the enemy sees you as a grasshopper, but when you begin to see yourself as a grasshopper, you're going to be a grasshopper. You ain't going to accomplish nothing. Amen. Amen. On the mighty voice. With two people. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it, no, listen, you can't be a part of the majority. Right. Sometimes you've got to be a couple. That's right. A remnant. Come on. Amen. 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 So we're well able to do yes. what God says. Exactly. Amen. Here's the problem. Because the ten said they couldn't, the two had to follow them around for so many years. With that uh, generation yeah. that off. Okay. Sometimes, because of who you're connected with, yeah. you have to pay a price. That's right. That's true. Be careful who you're connected with. Be exactly. careful who you hang out with. Careful who you listen to. Amen. Okay? If you join yourself with somebody, so it's just like a married couple. The wife may be on fire for God and the husband's not. Well, God can't do what he wants to do in that family like he'd like to because they're divided. Right. Now, right. if they were together as one, God can do anything. Yes. That's right. Yes. Yes. Amen. A lot of times he can't. And the wife pleads and begs, but you've joined yourself. With, that's why he says, do not yoke yourself with an unbeliever. That's right. If you have never been married, don't go out and marry an unbeliever because you're going to have more hell than you want to be. Okay. Well, I'm going to marry him and, and I'm, I'm believing God's going to change him. Uh-huh. You know what? That may take you 30 or 40 years. Do you want to put up with that kind what of stuff? What you see is what you get. That's why he says, marry <laughs> a believer. Like, seriously. That way, I when you've got two you people in agreement, God says, when two touch and agree, they can ask anything. Yes, yes, yes. Husband and wife praying together. Woo, so powerful. powerful. Amen. Man. Yes, amen. That's awesome. I know we got all subject a little bit here. He said, he said, I'm a revivalist. I'm seeing people revive, blind eyes, deaf ears open, terminal disease healed, demons cast out, the dead raised, people born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit. All around the world, I'm seeing millions of people's lives being changed. But I'm not asking God to do it. I'm praying, Lord, I know you desire a revival. Please help me be the vessel of your love and power that I need to be. I yield myself to him, praying to and fellowshipping with him, and allowing him to transform me by his word and by his presence. By what? By his His word and by his presence. Glory. Then I go out and I speak the word of God. I command healings and miracles to manifest, and I'm seeing revival. People are being revived. He said, I've received emails daily from Asia, Africa, and Europe testifying how different people have been revived. They're changed by God's word and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not by me begging God in some prayer flaw. He's not up in heaven with his arm folded saying, beg a little harder. <laughs> Get another 100,000 people to pray. Okay. Unless you fast all for twice a week, I won't do it. That's not God. No, it's not. Amen. Amen. God is in heaven with his arms out trying to release his power, saying, Is there anybody who will believe me? I believe. He said, Is there anyone who will stand up and start speaking, living, and demonstrating my word? If you'll do that, you'll have all the revival you can handle. You'll see people's yes. lives begin to change. The way many of us are praying, it seems like we have no influence, no authority, and no power to make God's kingdom come to pass here on this earth. 
How many times have we said, we're his hands, we're his feet, we're his body, we're his mouth. If we don't do it, it's not going to get done. That's right. Amen? Amen. He said, we approach him like a beggar, saying, oh God, please move, please have mercy, please touch us. That isn't accomplishing anything good. It's just making us bitter and angry over why hasn't God moved? How come he hasn't poured out his spirit? Why is God allowing this to go on? Why did he let that person die without first being saved? God isn't letting this happen. He is the one allowing our country to go to hell in a handbasket. God didn't make America basically a post-Christian nation. It's not God who hasn't poured out his spirit. It's many of us who have been begging him to do what he told us to do. We haven't taken him at his word. We haven't been operating in our authority. We've shirked our responsibility by trying to throw it all back on God. This isn't the model that we see in the New Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus never told us to plead with God to heal and pour out his spirit. You can't find an example where the Lord conducted his ministry that way. The Apostle Paul didn't either. There's no example of Apostle Paul ever asking his people to intercede or tear down the stronghold of Diana of the, of the Ephesians. She was a false a pagan goddess. This temple at Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the world. They had over 1,000 priestesses who had sex with the men as they came in to worship. As you might guess, the place was normally packed with people. Paul didn't try to do anything political. He didn't organize the church to pray, begging and pleading that God would start his, stop, his, stop this idol worship. He didn't get together with people and do spiritual warfare, binding and rebuking Diana of the Ephesians. What did Paul do? He preached and demonstrated the gospel. Yes. Paul told them, Diana of Ephesus isn't anything. This statue didn't fall from Jupiter. Diana is no God. There's only Amen. one true God. His son is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he did in Corinth, another Roman city known for multiple idols and immoral worship. He preached the truth, and God used the truth to set people free. Paul didn't organize intercessor to cover every zone in the region. He didn't have people do spiritual warfare or spiritual mapping. <laughs> These things are being done today by the church in an effort to try to change our nation or not what Jesus commanded us to do in the Word of God. And I was taught, you were taught, we're supposed to pray, we're supposed to walk around the church, we're supposed to intercede, we're supposed to do all those things, and those things are necessary. I'm yes. not taking them away from you. But in this instance, when you want God to move, God is not, we're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. That's true. Exactly. He's looking for somebody like Ezekiel said, here I am, Lord, send me. Exactly. Use me. Amen. He said, yeah, but I don't think God can use me. You know what? If God can use me, if God can use this kid, if he can use some of it, he can use anybody. That's exactly. Amen. That's right. Amen. 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 Hey, when he can't get a man to do it, he'll get a donkey to do it, you know? Burning bush. Burning bush. Burning bush, baby. I went to, I went to a new doctor the other day, and uh, he was saying, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I'm a paint contractor. He said, well, what do you do now? I said, I pastor in church. He looked at me. I said, I know God has a sense of humor. I'll do it like a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'll use the foolish thing to confound the wise. Amen. Amen. Ta-da. <laughs> that was good. It says in the New Testament, the believers went out and preached the word everywhere. They went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs. Following. Mark chapter 16, verse 20. They proclaimed and demonstrated God's word. As they preached the truth, the Holy Spirit bore supernatural witness of that truth. So many people repented and converted to Christ. The temple of Diana in Ephesus fell in disrepair. The people forsook it because they turned from her to God. Diana of the Ephesians hasn't been a factor in 2,000 years until the intercessors resurrected her a few years ago. They preached the word. And people got a hold of the word to where they forgot all about that goddess, that pagan act. Church, that's what the world's looking for today. They want to see the manifest power of God. 
And then we can give the world the manifest power of God, the love of God, not just the power. You've got to give the love. The power, Everything works right. through love. That's right. Okay? So you give them the love of God and the power of God. That's what's going to change their hearts and minds. Amen. That's what's going to make them want what you and I have. Here, can you turn that thing down a little bit? It'll be all right. Thank you, sir. He says, I'm not trying to be mean. I just want to challenge your thinking with God's word. Show me the New Testament where we send people to foreign countries to do nothing but pray and tear down spiritual strongholds. Show me the word of God where we send people on mission trips but forbid them to preach the gospel, saying, don't witness because you might get censored, punished, or persecuted. That's what's being done today. We spend millions of dollars to send people to foreign countries just to let them walk around and pray. You can't find a scriptural model for this. You might be able to twist and pervert a verse or two, but if you just take the word for face value, reading and believing it as it is, you can't find an example of this. However, you can find scripture where they pray for boldness. In Acts chapter 4, verse 29, Now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth their hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. Paul asked his friends to pray that he'd be bold despite his circumstances. How many times have we said we're going to do something for God and all of a sudden the devil raises his ugly head and does something and we, okay, we cower right. and we go the other direction? Yeah. Well, I guess God didn't want me to do it. No. <laughs> God wants you to do it, but he never said you wasn't going to have some adversity. Exactly, yes. I've because said this many times. Anytime you true. decide to do something for God, the devil's okay. going to do something to try to keep that. Is that okay? Yeah. And you got to press through. I've had people say, well, man, I, I was doing good, so I thought I was going to do this for God. And then all hell come against me. Sure did. Yeah. <laughs> but that's where you've got to believe God over your circumstances, exactly. and over your situation, Amen. over your pressure, yes. over Amen. whatever Amen. else is saying. And yes. say, you know what? I'm going to do it because God said Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm telling you. And you probably, you're going to learn, and I want him to testify. When you preach something after a year, you're going to get tested on it. Oh, yeah. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> right? <Amen. laughs> I told you, poor Pastor Roy said, won't you just preach on love? <laughs> Sometimes you get trouble. In fact, I, just, I told you this too. We were, I was going to preach a sermon on love one Sunday morning, and she and I got the biggest knockdown <laughs> drag out we've ever gotten to. <laughs> and the devil was sitting on my shoulder and said, yeah, you're going to go there and preach love, aren't you? I said, yeah, I am. I did. <laughs> No. <laughs> no. Right. Don't no. Yeah. Hey, that's not a and problem. Oh, yeah. Said, no. Oh, oh, no. Yeah. Y'all yeah. scared or what? <laughs> <laughs> you kidding? Go on. Uh, I'll bet. Yeah. Maybe one day. Yeah. He said, pray well, for me I that others may give unto me that I may open my mouth boldly and make known the mystery of the gospel, which right. I'm an ambassador in bonds. And there and I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. You know, Paul, let's be true. Sure. Paul was going through a lot of stuff. Yeah. Paul was going through a lot of stuff. That guy had a hard life. Yeah, yeah. But he didn't let things hold him up. He didn't let this right. He was shipwrecked. I mean, he was beaten. He was stoned. I mean, all kinds of things happened to him. But it didn't weaken him, it made him stronger. Now, why is it when things come against us, we let it chase us off or scare us or make us weak? No, we should be more determined. If God right. said, do this, I don't care what comes against me. I don't care Just who do says it. what. I don't care what demon shows up. I'm going to do what God says. Amen. Exactly. 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 Amen. Exactly. Glory. Amen. He said, the early New Testament believers prayed that they would be bold, faithful witnesses despite opposition. But they didn't ask God to just solemnly pour out his spirit on unbelievers without them preaching, demonstrating, and doing their part. There simply isn't a scriptural example for that. Basically, that's the reason the church isn't having more of a salt and light influence on our generation. We aren't really following the New Testament example. When Jesus gave power and authority to the church, it came with responsibility. We all want the power. We all want to see miracles. We all want to see healing. We all want to see all kinds of wonders. But there's a responsibility that comes with anything you do for God, there's a responsibility. You're going to be accountable to Him. The scripture says if you're a minister of the gospel, you're judged twofold. I'm judged by my own for my own sins, and I'm judged by what I preach to you. 
God will hold you. When you stand behind the pulpit, I don't care who you are, you are accountable to God, what you're sharing with people. Yes, yes. That's why you need to make sure you're sharing the truth, and you're sharing it from heart, and you're sharing it with love. There's some pastors, they'd love to pick out a sermon because they know this person got a problem and beat them to death with the word. That's not good. We had a pastor like that one time. She found out a problem and she used the word to beat you to death with it. Listen, that's not God. Mm-hmm. He said, speak the truth in love. If I'm going to correct him or anybody, I'm going to tell you what God's word says, but I'm going to do it with compassion. I'm going to do it with love so I can bring restoration, not healing. I'm not going to come over and beat you on the head with the word. Man, I don't want anyone to ever go back up there. Amen? But so many times when we find something, as a Christian, we find something wrong with a brother or sister in Christ, we can't wait to beat them to death with it. No. You're supposed to be the one saying, hey, you know what? I know you're hurt. I know you're crippled. I'm going to be there to help you. He said, those who have feeble needs, we're supposed to lift them up. We're supposed to encourage them. Not put them. The world's going to put you down. Let the world find out you've got a fault in your life and you're supposed to be a Christian. Oh, yeah. Boy, they'll use that. They'll beat you to death with you. Amen? Yeah. But when you come to the house of God, church, this is supposed to be a sanctuary. It's supposed to be a place of healing. We're not supposed to beat one another up. We're supposed to encourage one another. We're right. brothers and sisters in Christ. And listen, I'll tell you all the time. You better get where you love one another because you're going to spend eternity in heaven with them. They may be your next door neighbor. Amen? <laughs> He says, as they receive the truth into their hearts, their lives will be changed. Many people have rejected the preaching they've heard because it wasn't the true gospel. It was just powerless religion and lifeless tradition. It was just condemnation and judgment. That's not the message of the gospel. We need to preach the good news of salvation by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is the power of God. Romans 1.16 We went to a Baptist church with a guy I used to work with and uh, because he comes to church with me, so we said, well, go to your church. We went to church in McLean, to a Baptist church. And uh, that pastor kept saying, you need to be careful. God will get you. God will get you with a lightning bolt. Yeah, you can't do this. You. I'm thinking, my gosh, that's not encouraging. <laughs> that makes me run around and go, oh, God, if I mess up. <laughs> yeah. you know? No. If I mess up, I want to know that's a God down there says, here, son. Let's get back up and try that. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's the God I serve. That's the God you serve. Amen. 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 Yes. All right. Let's see if he's listening. <laughs> According to 1 Timothy 2 5, how many mediators are there now between man and God? Oh, Jesus. Oh. Name of Jesus Christ. Amen. What does the mediator do? Like, uh, <laughs> he tries to reconcile. Okay? He tries to bring both parties together. That's what Jesus does. He's our mediator between us and God. He's constantly praying. You know when people say, I don't have no way praying for him? Jesus is constantly praying for us. Amen? Amen. All right. Galatians 3.19 reveals the law who was ordained by angels in the hand of whom? A mediator. How did the Lord respond when Moses prayed for him to turn from his fierce wrath and repent of his evil against his people in Exodus 32 years later? That's the Lord the evil that he thought to do unto the people. That's a crazy you know, thank God it wasn't Moses. Can you imagine? God wants to wipe them out and start all over again. And Moses intercedes for him. Lord, if you killed him, you got to take me too. It'd be me up like, Lord, let's start with a new batch. <laughs> <laughs> These people here are a mess. Let's just start all over again. <laughs> yes, give them away. <laughs> According to Hebrews 10, 10, 14, by one offering, he has perfected for how long them that are sanctified? Forever. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 reveals that God has reconciled us to himself by whom? What ministry has he given to us? Reconciliation. Reconciliation. That means you are supposed to go and try to make things better. 
You don't go gang up on somebody. You don't go put them down. You don't go beat them up. Even the scripture, the scripture says if you've got awe against somebody, go to that person. And if that doesn't do it, then take somebody with you. And if that doesn't work, then turn them over to the church. But when he says take somebody with you, he doesn't mean get your buddies to go over and gaps. Yeah, you dirty dog. <laughs> <laughs> no, he means get someone spiritual that can help you to bring reconciliation out of this situation so it'll be good again and not bad like this. God, he's a God of restoration. Look at your life before God and look at your life now. He's restored. He's paid back. He's He's taken all those broken pieces of our life and begin to put them together Amen. to make us whole. Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Yes. What word has He committed to us? The word of reconciliation. What did Jesus say in John 19 30, right before He bowed His head and gave up the ghost? He was finished. He fulfilled all that He was required to fulfill. Okay? He paid the price that we couldn't pay between us and God. He suffered more than any of us will probably ever suffer. And all because he loves you. And it hurts my heart when I hear somebody say, well, I know I messed up and God doesn't love me. You think God quit loving you that easy? No. That's why you need to read your scripture. This is nothing can separate you from the love of God. <laughs> Nothing here, nothing there, life, death, nothing. He said nothing can separate you from the love of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Look how many times the Israelites screwed up. You know, and you think, we, we look at them and we laugh at them and we think, man, you think they had learned. We're just as guilty. That's right. God will do some miraculous thing for us and we'll live our life a little while. We'll forget all about what God did over there. How God brought us out of that or how God did something to help us in this situation. Where we're, oh, God, oh, no, what's going He's the same God that did it over here. You think he's not going to do it over here? If you believe him? Amen. Amen. And when he says finish, church, not only the sacrifice for sins, but God is no longer angry with us. Amen. Jesus paid the price so that God's wrath is not going to be poured out on us. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the wrath of God is not for you, it's for those unbelievers. That's right. Think about this. Everybody knows how much we don't know. We have a, an idea how much God's love was like. How much God loves us. He loves us with an unconditional love. Think about his wrath and his judgment. If he can love us with an unconditional love, he can allow things to happen through his wrath. They're going to be unconditional. People think the worst thing, well, I'm going to go to hell. If I, that, that's not the worst thing. You're going to have to deal with God's Almighty's wrath. And then you're going to be separated from Him all eternity. But it was not much. Oh, yeah, you do. When you're in hell and, and you were created to have fellowship with God and you can't have it and you know you can't have it, you're going to feel so hopeless and so helpless. And not just the feeling is going to pass over, that feeling is going to be there for all eternity. And you can't stop it. You can't yeah. stop it. And that's the thing. When you try to tell people, oh, I don't believe in hell. We're going to be in the hell. I'll go party in hell. Thinking, you blind, blind, blind person. Yeah. And I was that way one time. Oh, hey, I ain't worried about hell. Well, when your eyes are open, the scales are taken off, and you see the truth, and you realize, you know, there is a literal hell, and people are going to go there. A lot of people say, oh, everybody's going to heaven. Bible says hell has to enlarge itself. That's right. Doesn't say heaven has to enlarge itself. It says hell has to enlarge itself. That's scary. He said many go the broad way, few go the narrow way. Amen. 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 And Mark four, uh, Mark two four. What did this six man's friends do to get him into the crowd of house where Jesus was teaching? They tore off the roof. They tore off the roof. I like this song. According to Acts 5, verses 15 and 16, how many of the sick and demonized folks were healed? Oh, oh, oh. Every one. 
Acts 16 20 says the early believers went forth in what everywhere. Preach the gospel. And I just want to say this too. You may not know the Bible well enough to preach it to someone, but everybody has had an experience with Christ and you can share your experience. Exactly. When I first got saved, I didn't know what the Bible I just a little bit here. I learned in school a little bit here and there. But what I shared with people is I know who I was and they knew who I was. And I tell them, I didn't change myself. God changed. I begin to share what God had done in my life. That got their attention. You know, you can sit up here and quote all kinds of scriptures to people. I used to have a, a friend that worked for me, and he'd tell me all the time, I don't want to hear all these scriptures. But he would listen to what God was doing in my life. And there's a lot of people that way. They don't want to hear the Bible quoted to them or given to them. But you can tell them, you know what? I was just like you. And now look at my life. Look how it's changed. Even the Apostle Paul had acts it. A lot of times, say, get up there, you know, you really don't beat him up with scripture. He tells him his experience with Jesus. He tells him, Y'all knew me as this man, then I had this encounter with God, with Jesus, and now here I am. And that was like a lot of how his method is. Well, think about him, Paul. Paul called himself the cheapest of sinners. God took a man that went around threatening all the Christians, he turned around and began to use him for his own. I think scripture where it says God will take up the devil and the arm and he'll turn around and use it for his glory. That's what he did. Amen. How did the Lord confirm the word? The signs and wonders. The signs following. In the midst of persecution they were experiencing, how did the early believers in Acts pray to be able to speak forth the word? Acts of boldness. Boldness. How did Paul ask his friends to pray for him in Ephesians 6 concerning the mystery of the gospel? That they may have the spirit of knowledge and revelation. That others may be given to him to open his mouth and speak boldly. Listen, you may not be a, a conversationalist. You may not be a person that likes crowds or talking to people. But when you open your mouth, God can give you the words to say. Amen. Amen. Yes. Sometimes y'all think joy is kidding about me being quiet at home. <laughs> Sometimes I want to have joy. Can we just not talk? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm not a talker, a conversational person. If, if I know you, I, I can talk to you about God. I can talk to you about guns. But if I don't know you, I don't have much to say to you. But when I get up here, it's like he puts so much in there that sometimes I, I go a little too long because I feel like, man, I just want you to get what he's saying. Because it will change your life. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. How did, uh, according to Romans 1 16, the gospel is the power of God, the salvation to who? Sure. To everyone who believes. Yes. Everyone who believes. all the time, the word works, but you've got to work the word. Amen? Thank you. All right, give yourselves a clap. We're going to close it there, church. Anybody have any questions or comments? We all good? Yes, sir. That's our confession, and we're sticking with it. <laughs> That's our confession, and we're sticking, sticking with, with it. it. That's my story, and sticking with it. Troy was sitting back there with uh, Brother Bones Sunday morning. He went up a couple of times. He wanted to get up and leave. She just grabbed a hold of him and when he was gone. But, but anyway, she, we went to lunch with him. And he said, People are going to be talking about you. Joyce said that song, Give them something to talk about. <laughs> and she said, I was just trying to make sure he stayed here because I really felt like God had a word for him. And God did. And he really ministered. You know, you look at bones on the outside, you think, that's a rough dude. But I'm telling you, I never heard anybody, and I went to jail with him to minister to somebody in jail. I never heard anybody in my life be able to minister in a jail ministry like that man can. Mm -hmm. I sit back at all and just let him do his thing. He came over and cut some trees for me one time, and the guy just ministered, lived across the street, called me up and said, and there's this long haired tattooed dude over at your house. I said, I know he goes to my church. He's cutting trees. 
<laughs> but we judge so quickly by the outside. And God says, thank God. He said, I judge you. Amen. Amen. Give God some praise.